All right. Um, I'm here to introduce Don Stewart, uh, a notable Haskell programmer. He's had his, he's been part of most major Haskell projects. Uh, he's probably, probably one of the most famous ones is Xmonad, that which, which I use a lot. I know most of my friends use. It's 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 very nice, and uh, he currently works for Ogawa, which uh, does uh, uh, very critical software components. And he's going to talk to us about Haskell and multi-core and Gawa in general. All right, thank you. OK. So I don't know if you guys saw the, the last two talks. There's kind of a convergence there where we saw a language that was added, designed for productivity, improving the productivity of writing editors. And then we saw another talk on improving security via separation and isolation and controlling side effects. And this, this talk is really going to be about a language that does that and then how we can use those properties to do multi-core programming. So I think this is really the, the, the big challenge in programming languages for the next 10 years is, is, is multi-core. How to make effective use of the hardware that people are spitting out for us. The hardware is getting increasingly complicated. It's, it's uh, many levels of nested memory hierarchies now. We have these hybrid designs where you have uh, dedicated coprocessors that are you know, particular programming models like GPUs that are quite different to a regular CPU. We also have multiple processors, obviously. And there's massive compute power sitting there. We just have to utilize it effectively. Um, but to do this, we're going to need new programming models. So Haskell, if you, if you don't know what Haskell is, it's a, a purely functional language, um, purely as in side effects are ruled out by default and you have to enable them explicitly. Uh, it's strongly statically typed. The type, it also has type inference, so you don't have to write type declarations. The types are used to improve optimization, to do scheduling, to do all sorts of things, and to do in interesting proofs about your program's behavior. It's 20 years old, so it's been around for quite a while. Um, it's really started picking up in industrial use the last 10 years, and in particular, the last three or four years. Uh, it's open source, it's not owned by anyone, and in fact, it was created as a, an open source competitor to a purely functional language from the late 80s called Miranda. So it's, it's had this uh, very vigorous open source community driving it. Um, there's, the main implementation is a compiler and also a bytecode interpreter, GHC. There are links here so you can download, uh, particularly the Haskell platform. During this talk, I have um, on my blog, I have all the source that goes along with the talk. So you can actually run, if you have a multi-core laptop, you can run the programs, play around with them during the talk. And one of the things that was originally part of the design for Haskell was that it would run on parallel hardware. So back in 1990, you couldn't buy off-the-shelf parallel systems very easily. So the, the, the language people were building hardware. The early, the early Haskell conferences were hardware software conferences, where people would demo the new hardware that they would then run their languages on top of. And that really wasn't going to scale, because Intel could produce this hardware much cheaper than the, the guys in Glasgow could. Um, so we sort of sat back, just working on the language for 10, 15 years, and then suddenly all the multi-core chips arrived, and we were ready to go with this language that was built for it. So why? Well, purity, laziness, and types, in particular, these are three features of the language, let us do many different programming models and take advantage of parallelism. Um, you can find more parallelism in code that's pure because there's less dependencies on data, there's no, and there's less side effects. So you can reorder computations, and you can find ways to run things in parallel. There's no specified execution order whatsoever in Haskell. So you can reduce things sequentially. You can run them in multiple threads. You'll get the same result. It doesn't matter which way you reduce this thing, as long as uh, you'll still get the same program, uh, the same result. It's also safe to speculate, so you can run stuff, you can run pure code before you need it, and it's not going to write files to disk uh, unnecessarily. It's just going to return a value, and it will have already been computed when you need it, which is kind of cool. So the language is really designed to be safe by default, and then you explicitly enable unsafe things. So kind of the lesson that we saw with the Chrome talk just before, where Browsers were built as this big monolithic thing, and then they have to sort of pull it all apart, make the bits safe, and then try and rebuild it. Here we start with a language that just says everything is safe. If there's any problems with it, you have to give us the proof that that's going to be safe to break uh, the invariance. It's a very high-level language, so it's more productive than C++. It's typically sort of on the Python. It looks a bit like Python. Um, but it's statically typed and has a very aggressive optimizer to take advantage of all these invariants the compiler knows. So it's much faster than the dynamically typed languages, Python and Erlang. Um, and it, unlike, say, C Sharp, Java, it doesn't run on .NET or the JVM. It has its own high-performance runtime. Um, Simon Marlow is the main guy who's been working on that, where the performance of threads and parallelism is really the driver for development. 
that's been around for quite quite a while. The performance thing, here's the shootout. I took this screenshot um, a few weeks ago. The, the great language shootout, you can enter programs in your language. They just have to do the same thing as other programs in each category. They recently got a quad core, and so Haskell went from like 14th to, well, it was fourth when I took this, um, just because we've start, started using all the cores, and so suddenly the high-level language approach pays off because it can use the hardware more efficiently. So the goal here is to two different things. Parallelism, to exploit the parallel hardware, you know, multiple chips, to run stuff in parallel, real, real parallel parallel um, to improve performance. So parallelism is really about improving performance, not changing the results or anything like that. Concurrency is the other aspect, where we're, we have logically independent tasks that we're using as a structuring technique. So we'll say, my web server will be a concurrent server. It will have all these separate threads of execution, logically. They don't necessarily run in parallel. They may just run on a single processor, uh, interleaved. Um, so they're, quite, they're separate concepts. I'm going to touch on both today. Um, so the stuff you'll see. Some is about improving performance, and some is about, or actually most of it's about improving performance. Some is about hiding latency uh, via concurrency, which also happens to improve performance, but kind of a separate technique. Okay, so the overview for today, a little bit of a background you just saw. I'll cover the tool chain, um, and there's some links that you can download um, the Haskell platform and start writing code. Uh, I'll cover the runtime architecture, how the, how the runtime structures stuff so we can write parallel programs. And then there's four different um, techniques that I want you to take away. Sparks and parallel strategies, uh, threads, messages, and shared memory, using transactional memory, and then finally data parallelism. So these are four different ways of doing parallel and concurrent programming in Haskell that we'll cover. Um, I'll mention debugging and profiling a little bit and a little bit about the garbage collector. So um, the source for the talk and the source for the examples are online. If you Google multi-core Haskell now or go to my website, the, there's tarballs for all this stuff. Okay, so if you've never seen Haskell before, here it is. It's very concise. It's white space sensitive. You can ex in, you can insert uh, braces and semicolons if you want, but very few people do. The compiler will insert them for you based on indentation. So it's a, a, white, a bit like Python. Uh, it's a little bit more flexible than Python in terms of how indenting works. It has uh, it's a functional language, so we see. Function application is white space here. It's uh, the most common thing you do in the language, so we give it the shortest operator, white space. So take is applied to two arguments there, a 1,000 and primes. It has infinite data structures, so we see two dot dot is a lazy list of numbers. It has uh, pattern matching, so here we take apart uh, the head of a list and the tail. It also uses the same syntax for taking apart structures and constructing them. So here we build a list that's taken from the input list where we take the first thing and then sieve the result. It has comprehensions um, from set notation. Uh, here we have x comes from x's. So for each, this is a map. Every x in x's where x mod p is greater than 0 yield that into a list. And then we lazily produce a sequence of primes. There are no types here because it has type inference. So you can insert types if you want wherever you feel you need them. Sometimes that's useful for performance reasons. So you can say, oh, it's an int, not an integer. It'll be a word-sized value. Um, and especially when you're doing uh, the type system is fairly flexible, so you can do some pretty complicated uh, proofs, essentially, about the behavior of your program in the type. And then you'll want to write the types down because they're pretty uh, extensive documentation, the machine check documentation, essentially. But it has type inference. How do you compile it? Well, it's a compiled language. It looks a lot like any compiled language. You run the compiler, some optimization flags. Dash dash make says find any libraries that are on my system and pull them in. You don't have to specify the packages explicitly. And it generates an executable in native code that when you run, generates a list of primes, the first 1,000 primes. That's sequential code. To do a parallel version that runs on the parallel runtime and uses multiple threads, you just add the threaded flag at compile time, which links in the threaded runtime. Um, and then you run it with how many OS threads you want to have all your Haskell threads multiplexed onto. So here we build our primes thing, and then we run it with eight OS threads. Um, throughout this talk, though, I'm not really going to talk about OS threads. These are the heavyweight stuff you see, like in the Chrome talk before, was about OS threads. I'm going to be mostly talking about Haskell threads, which are much lighter weight green threads that are multiplexed by the runtime onto the real OS threads. And we'll see that in a sec. One fundamental point of Haskell is that side effects are ruled out by default, and you enable them explicitly. 
So the compiler can see just by looking at the type of something if it has side effects. So if it writes to disk or if it uh, mutates memory in place. These are things that can break parallelism, they can break other safety invariants. So we make sure they're tagged explicitly. The compiler doesn't have to think hard to discover them um, or be pessimistic about it. It's very clear when there's a side effect. Um, so anything that has a side effect will have one, like an IO type if it can do anything. If it has more restricted side effects, then it might be in the ST uh, box or monad um, where you can just have memory effects. So uh, essentially, imperative programming is off by default, and there's, there's arbitrary and arbitrary evaluation order is allowed. So this, uh, this static separation of effects from pure code really lets us be pretty aggressive about our parallelism. Okay. So the tool chain, GHC is the main compiler. 6.10 is out now. 6.12 is probably going to be out next week. There's a, uh, there's a one-click installer for pretty much every, plat uh, every distro out there now. If you just go, to, go there, there's a Windows installer and a Mac installer and lots and lots of Linux distros. Fedora ships with the Haskell platform now, Fedora 12. Debian just got the Haskell platform. So it's very easy to get the same environment on every distro. It's really important if you're a language person. You want to make sure it's very easy for your users to uh, install the toolchain and start running stuff and not just fight building compilers all day. Um, 6.12 in particular has been fairly well optimized for Sparks, which we'll see in a sec, and the, the garbage collector has been tuned to run in parallel a little bit more efficiently. Okay, so the runtime. The runtime is kind of the foundation of, on which all this stuff's built. The model is there are multiple virtual CPUs each virtual CPU has a pool of OS threads, typically one-to-one, -one, right? So if I have eight cores, I'll have eight OS threads. Sometimes you might have nine or ten, a few more, if you're trying to hide latency. Um, then there are lightweight Haskell threads on top, and there you might have hundreds to millions of Haskell light lightweight threads. These are mapped down onto the available OS threads. Um, the OS, in turn, is scheduling its threads around, moving them between cores and so on. Um, there's automatic thread migration, load balancing in the runtime. So the runtime's going to spot when there are idle threads on one core and start shipping work to it to keep the work uniformly distributed. It has a parallel generational garbage collector. So there's uh, young and old generations. Data's moved between young and old as it's used. The garbage collector takes care of everything for you. There's no reference counting or anything like that. This is a sophisticated parallel garbage collector to really try and get maximum performance out of the GC. Um, it has transactional memory and it has MVARs, a built-in synchronization mechanisms for mutable memory that we'll see. So there's the concurrency hierarchy. Um, I think this is the first time anyone's actually written this down, which is kind of a surprise to me. But uh, these are also not to scale. So there's actually typically two orders of magnitude more things at each level. So we might have four CPUs. We'll run three or four OS threads when I say dash N four. On top of that, I might have 10,000 Haskell threads. Um, so several orders of magnitude more. On top of that, I might have maybe 500 million sparks, and these are tiny unevaluated expressions that are sitting in a pool of work that we speculate on that will get turned into a Haskell thread when we need them. Um, so we're trying to annotate and find as much parallelism as possible and make parallelism very cheap to hint at, even though the available hardware is obviously nowhere near what your typical Haskell program says there is in terms of parallelism. So my, I would love to have a couple of hundred thousand hardware threads, but sadly, we only have a few hardware threads at the moment. There's a, there's a cool blog, uh, ghcspark.blogspot.com, where they got a Sun donated a T2, which has 64 hardware threads, and we just get excellent scaling, because you can use the hardware threads to hide all the latency and start turning more of these Haskell threads into real OS threads. But we have to wait for the hardware to catch up. The language is a little bit further along. How do you, well, we talked about this, how to compile it. The main thing is you want to use the SMP, the parallel runtime, make sure you give it the right number of OS threads. OK, so that's the background to the tool chain. Technique one, the highest level technique, it's a deterministic form of parallelism where we use speculation to generate lots and lots of parallel work tasks and have the runtime work out which ones to run. It's a form of semi-implicit parallelism. And I call it, refer to it either sparks or strategies. Sparks are the unit of work, a bit like a thread for the next layer down. And strategies are ways of combining uh, functions that generate sparks into different patterns. So this is kind of the thesis for why purely functional code is good, or pure code, referentially transparent code is good. If there's no side effects, we can run things in any order. 
it doesn't matter which order we evaluate them in because there's, they're all the same. They all produce the same result. So we could evaluate every sub-expression in parallel. Um, so x and y, y and 2 could be evaluated to whatever their results are, and we can do the, the computation, the expressions on either side, and then we can join them together. And it's always safe to do this. We're not going to get a different result if we try and evaluate the pure code in a different order. Um, so that's a really good property that you have, that the compiler knows it can reorder stuff. Um, however, it generates far too many tasks. So I was sort of hinting on, at that already. If you try and do every task in parallel, you're going to get millions and millions and billions of expressions, and our hardware just doesn't have that many hardware threads. So what we need is a way to cut down the amount of parallelism, because there's actually too much in the default strategy. And that's what Sparks let us do. So we have these annotations. You put it on the code to hint where parallelism would be a good idea, because you can see that there's some work that you're going to have to compute about the same time that you need some other work done. And the runtime will pick up one of these things and run it in parallel to, uh, to another. It's a very cheap way of adding parallelism after the fact. You just hunt through for expressions that look expensive and tag them as, as worthwhile to speculate on. And it's deterministic. So you can, if you add more or less sparks, you just get slower code or faster code. You don't get different code. You don't get wrong result produced. That's a really good property. And there's no threads, there's no locks, there's no communication explicit. This is a very, very high level way of getting parallelism. And sometimes you can get really good speed ups. So this is in the parallel library. If you have the Haskell platform installed, you can say cabal unpack parallel, and it'll just dump the source into your current directory, and you can play around with it. Um, and this, this is in every GHC bundle. So how does it work? You have this par combinator, par. Uh, two arguments. The first is the thing you want to speculate on, and the second is the thing you want to evaluate right now. So this just says, it would be a good idea to evaluate A at the same time as B, and then evaluate B. So the runtime says, oh, OK, you're going to need A later. I will see if there's some resources available to execute that. Later on, I'll refer to A, and magically, it's already been evaluated for me. So it creates a Spark. Spark is in that sort of cloud of jobs that m might be worthwhile to evaluate. It doesn't guarantee they're going to get evaluated in parallel. Um, if there's available resources, so the, the load balancing and, and the amount of the load on the machine is OK, one of these Sparks will get turned into a thread and then run on a real core. Um, there are no restrictions on where you can put this in your code. So that's, an, that's a really strong property, that you can just sprinkle this stuff anywhere. Um, and the worst case is you'll just create way too many Sparks, and few of them will get run on your hardware. So it's always safe. I keep emphasizing that. You don't want to break your code by adding parallelism to it. That's not a scalable model for programming. So it's up in this layer here. We're going to be generating lots of these little, little blue stars with um, par. It doesn't guarantee a, he a thread, like I said. The runtime decides on whether you should convert the Spark into a real thread and execute it on another core. Um, so that's good. You don't have to worry about the conditions your program will be executing in, where, how many cores there are, what kind of workload. The runtime will figure that out dynamically. You just write it once and say, it's probably a good idea to branch you know, n times, let the runtime work out exactly how many threads you want. Because they're cheap and because the runtime will prune unnecessary work, you can over-approximate the amount of parallelism. So you just go sprinkling these paths in in all the good-looking places, and you'll probably get a good speed up. However, that's not enough. You can't just say par. You have to also sometimes pin work into a particular thread. For example, when we have A plus B, we want to do A in one thread. Then we want to do B right now in the thread that I'm executing. And then when I'm done with B, I'll add A to B, and hopefully A is already done. So we use PSEQ to say, uh, don't create a, another spark or anything. Do A first and then go and look at the rest of the expression in B. So these are the two combinators you need. So if I want to do two expressions in parallel properly, um, F and E are two expressions that are functions, something like that, that will be quite expensive to compute. They should be about the same cost. We'll do F in a spark. We'll do E in the current thread. And then by the time E is done, we then evaluate F. Oh, look, it's already done for us. Then we add it to E. So if you have the source, uh, this just adds two, it's just two big mathematical expressions. We add them together. Um, if we run it with dash threaded and then only, uh, no, well, dash n zero, there's no extra thread here. This is one CPU, takes two seconds. If we run it on two cores, it uses 140% CPU and takes a little bit less. Like, well, a pretty good speed up, but not perfect. So that's sort of a, a little hello world program. Why, why doesn't it perfectly parallelize? 
mainly because the two expressions aren't exactly the same size. So one finishes a little bit before the other one does, and then one calls it idle. Um, it's important not to accidentally parallelize things this way. So if we say f par f plus e, I'll spark f, then the main thread will execute f. So we've got two threads executing f now. One of them will win. It doesn't matter which, but I'm wasting time. It doesn't break my program to do this. It just makes it slower because I'm duplicating work. Whichever one finishes, finishes, and then we go on and evaluate e. So parallelizing this correctly depends on the way plus evaluates its arguments. Um, but pseq is the way we rule this out. Uh, threads that get clumped on, like say we, we, the main thread evaluates f before the spark even gets created, then the runtime will prune the spark for f, and this is called, called fizzling. It, the spark fizzles. Um, so how can we tell how many sparks are getting created into threads? You can use the dash stutter flag to GHC, any, any Haskell program. And it spits out all this stuff about its memory footprint and how the parallel garbage collector is working and the load balance. And then it says sparks created two, two were converted into real threads, zero were pruned. And then there's the speed up. So this is the kind of thing we want to see. We want to see you know, a few thousand sparks created and a few thousand turned into threads. Um, there's also a new tool called ThreadScope, which lets you visualize this stuff. So in the top, um, in the top we have two cores. Orange is garbage collection, and purple is execution of code, useful work. And that doesn't parallelize. That's doing F plus E in the one thread. The garbage collector still runs on two cores. But you can really easily see, oh, crap, I didn't parallelize my code very well. And then um, if I parallelize it correctly, you see, whoa, they're both executing full, nonstop. There's little bits of garbage collection in between. One of them finishes a little bit before the other one, which we saw from the speed up, and then we're done. So visualization is really important for parallelizing well because it's a dynamic property. You have to look at what, you know, based on input, based on the amount of resources on your machine, you'll get different parallelization. And so you need to be able to inspect dynamically and profile. It's hard to reason statically about how well things are going to parallelize in this model. There are ways to find more parallelism, though. So we just had a top-level parallelism where we basically generated two sparks, evaluated them. Uh, we can push the parallelism down more because sparks are very cheap. So here I have a really simple recursive function, so a loop, um, where each time round I generate a spark. I, I want to do two things each time round, add n1 to n2. And I generate a spark for one of these computations each time round. So that's going to generate a new, potentially a new thread for every loop, every step in the loop. In practice, well, we'll see what happens. So we push down the recursion. Where there's way, way, way many more sparks are going to be generated. So hopefully there's a lot of work to keep the processes occupied. Um, when we run it without any uh, extra thing, we don't get any speed up. So I didn't use plus n there. It takes 23 seconds. And then if I add dash n2, generates all those sparks, and some more of them get turned into threads, and it's a bit faster. We use more CPU, 136%, and we shaved off three seconds. So again, only a little faster. So what went wrong, you might be able to guess, we generated way, way, way too many sparks. So we generated 700 million sparks, of which 116 got turned into threads. So that's still a lot more than the cores I've got, so that's good. So I was able to generate more work um, but still, I wasted a lot of effort generating sparks that were just thrown away. Still went faster, though, which is kind of cool. So what do we do? Well, we need to push down the recursion, but not too much, not too many sparks. Um, so par is cheap. And the cheaper you can make par in, in, in cost, the more of it you can do. So the more of these things you can generate safely. But it's still not free. So we need some kind of cutoff. Here we have the top level one, which loops generating sparks until some depth I wish I stop and I switch over and run straight line code that doesn't generate any sparks. This is sort of a, uh, and then um, as we'll see, there are strategies that you can just annotate to say, do this and then cut off here without having to duplicate code like this. Um, so this is going to run straight line code. It's going to generate sparks to a certain depth and then just run straight line code. So here we get excellent speed up. So it uses 190% CPU on the laptop in that bag and it takes four seconds. So we just, we, way less work was an overhead were created. This is a much more efficient program. So, yeah. Yeah, so, so a spark, 
basically is a pointer to an unevaluated computation. It goes into a queue associated with each thread, and the thread will then flip it over and execute it. Um, so it's cheap. It's basically pushing a pointer into a queue. Um, so it's like the cost of a function call. So it's not, not too expensive. I, I can't, it just got cheaper. So I haven't yet benchmarked exactly how many cycles it takes. Um, I like to think of it as extremely cheap unless shown otherwise. So if it turns out that I generated far too many, then, oh, okay, I've, I've noticed how expensive it is. But you should think of it as very cheap, like a function call. Uh, garbage collection, so the GHC garbage collector is parallel. It fires up all your cores, and they start traversing the heap, getting rid of waste data that no, has no, no more references to it. It stopped the world at the moment, though, so it stops all the threads from executing code, collects stuff, and restarts them. You don't want to stop all your threads very often. Um, so it's important to just check. Typically, you don't have to, but with parallel code, sometimes you can generate a lot more data than you, than you think. And so you can increase or you can decrease the pressure that allocating data has on the garbage collection, um, which means you get more performance. Um, it looks like GHC is going to get a per CPU collector soon. So each thread, each call will be able to collect its local generation um, entirely separate to all the other cores, and they'll just continue executing. Um, okay. So here's, uh, this is the NoFib benchmark, which is just a set of really classic Haskell programs, do very simple things that um, Simon Marlow went and paralyzed after the fact. He just added some pars here and there just to see the different kinds of scaling you get from off-the-shelf code that was never written for parallelism. Right? So this is after the fact, annotating existing code to run in parallel. And some of the things parallelize really well. Um, and some of them sort of flatten off. So we're not going to see, if we get 512 core machines, you're not going to see every program parallelized to 512. Very few. We're going to be writing in a completely different style to use those resources. Um, maybe Google Chrome will help us there by having lots of processes using up the other cores. So the programming model, deterministic. So it doesn't matter whether you're running on one core or thousands. You will get the same result. It do, you get the same result with par as without. So you always get the same result. This is really important. Um, this is good for reasoning because you're Reasoning about the code doesn't get any more complicated by adding par. You can just erase the par and do whatever thinking you need to do about the code. Add the pars back in, you have the same program. Um, the cheap requires measurement, though. Um, so you have to sort of guess at how expensive a computation is. Do you have any numbers that show what has it as good par, but if you're running on one single core? I don't, but you could do it. Write a program. It's easy. Yeah. Oh, OK. Well, Haskell.org slash platform. Click. And then, but we can have a look afterwards. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, but it would be cool. There's a little library that lets you measure the cycles that a computation takes. So you can do that and get the cycle count, and that would be useful. Um, there is a strategies library in the parallel thing that is a set of standard ways of parallelizing things with Sparks, um, such as, oh, I have a list. I probably want to do each element of that list in parallel to each other. Um, and it captures up common patterns like that, so you don't have to manually add pars all the time. You can just use the strategies. So the thread model we talked about, we've been dealing with these sparks. How does it work? Well, N4 gives us those OS threads. The runtime maps my Haskell threads, the little gray guys, onto the OS threads, which are heavy, and you don't want too many of them. Um, we get one OS thread per CPU, typically, unless you add more than you've got. It's probably not a good idea to do that. Um, the worker threads move around. And then each CPU has a pool of sparks that are generated when you call par. Um, and idle worker threads will just steal work from that if they have nothing else to do, and then execute them. So you're just generating all this extra work to keep the machine busy. Um, and then if they get idle, they'll pull work from each other's queues. So it's a work stealing model. So they're just constantly, the cores are constantly trying to find work from your Haskell program to execute. So it's very cheap to annotate programs this way. It's a very fine-grained approach to parallelism, so you're going right down deep into the structure of your program to identify computation. Um, the sparks obviously need to, need to be cheap if you're going to be aggressive with them. Having work stealing really helps, because then you, you get free migration. Um, it relies on purity, obviously, because we're speculating that we will need a result in the future, so you may as well execute it now. If that code had a side effect, it would be visible before it would, it would happen before you actually wanted it to happen. Um, and Sparks may get running multiple threads simultaneously. So you would get the side effect retried. So you can't just go you know, deleting 
files on disk multiple times or launching missiles is the classic example. You don't speculate on launching missiles, that maybe in the future you'll need to launch missiles. So you may as well do it now and then I'll get the result later. So it critically relies on purity. Um, and it does take practice to learn where power is beneficial. Um, but I think it's a good tool. Question? They don't. They're fewer. They can't do I.O. It's a, t it's a static type error. Right? So your program won't... It puts the onus on the programmer in that their code will not compile if they try and do that. Or it doesn't, so <laughs> what, what happens is if you, if you say par on like a print statement, it, nothing happens. It evaluates it to a function that when applied to the real world state would print something, but doing it in parallel that has no effect. Yeah. So it's a static error to do this stuff wrong. You have to remember that the Haskell type system is a very strong type system, which means that if you can look at the type of something and it says it doesn't do I.O., it doesn't do I.O., and neither does anything that it calls. So it's always safe to parallelize. That's, that's really key. OK, so that's model one. And I think that's the most interesting one, and that's the one that's fairly unique to Haskell. Um, it's also very cheap and easy to get to use. However, we need to move sometimes in the layer below. This is a bit like uh, the memory management story that you have very high level memory management of garbage collection. Sometimes you want explicit control with malloc or something or alloc. Sometimes you want no memory management other than storing it in registers. So similarly for parallelism, we have very high level approaches that work for a lot of things. Then we have more and more control at lower layers. So the next layer down is explicit parallelism with threads and shared memory. So these guys, the red ones. And this lets us write direct stateful imperative programs. Um, we use fork IO, takes something that does anything, an IO action, can do anything, and write to disk, and runs it in a new Haskell thread, which will then get scheduled on one of the cores. You get a thread ID back. So that's how you create one of these lightweight threads. And you can cre they're very light, so you can create a million of them on a generic laptop fairly easily. Here's a program that is a, it's a concurrent program. It does two tasks logically in separate threads. We write a file, uh, we write a string to a file, in one thread. In the current thread, we check if the file that we're going to create exists already, and we print a result. And suddenly we're back in non-deterministic concurrent programming. Um, because the result of this program depends on which thread gets to the file first. If the main thread checks the file before the 4KO happens, it will say, no, it doesn't exist. If the other one does, it will say, it will exist. And you don't know. So this is quite a different, this is, this is your classic non-deterministic concurrency which is less safe. You have to think about race conditions and deadlocks and stuff like that. So the threads created with 4KO, they're preempted when they allocate memory, and another thread swaps in. You don't have to explicitly yield or anything like that. The, the runtime takes care of that. So that's a little bit of automation for you. It's non-deterministic, so it depends on heat pressure and stuff like that, the load on the machine. Um, when the main thread terminates, the one that starts with main, any threads that it, were fork, it forked are killed. So you get this really nice cleanup behavior, but it means also, uh, well, these are demonic threads. So if you exit the main thread before you thought you would, it cleans up everything. Um, and you can communicate between threads, which is obviously the next thing you want to do, by messaging or shared memory. So if you have the source, 08, 09, um, have some use, we throw and receive messages between threads. It's a very simple way of doing um, communication between threads. Uh, you throw a message, it interrupts the thread that you send it to, you send it, you call it with the, the thread ID, and then that thread says, oh, there's a message here, let me have a look at it. And then it can send messages back or change behavior. That's a very good technique. This is basically Erlang's model, where you, you, you interrupt threads with stuff, with stuff for them to do, and then they, they build handlers for the kinds of uh, behaviors they want to implement. Um, but I'm not going to say much more about that. It's a, it's a it's not a very popular technique in Haskell for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, the other way, though, is via shared memory with explicit synchronization. So sometimes we need to, we'll fork a thread that's going to do some computation, and we need its result eventually. And you have to block until that result's there. So uh, in pure code, there's no mutation of values. You can't, you can't poke something in memory and have the other thread see that effect immediately. We have to explicitly enable mutable memory um, with, via MVARs or transactional memory. And we'll use this mutable memory to synchronize. So 
the main technique is MBARs. This is, this is really the standard technique for synchronizing. Here we have two functions. MBARs are a synchronizing box that holds a value. So they're kind of like a pointer to something, but they're a pointer that is special. Because threads will block if there's nothing in the box and they, and they, wanna, they need the value. Or they'll block if they're trying to put something in the box and there's a value already there. So you get this natural um, sync mechanism. Um, and the runtime puts the threads to sleep. So if I call take, I say, give me the message from this box with take, and the thread that's going to put it there hasn't put it there yet, the runtime just puts me to sleep. And then when it appears, it wakes me up and says, here you go. So here's a program. It creates a new piece of shared memory, the box, that's empty. We fork a thread that computes f, and then it stores the evaluated result of f in the box. The main thread computes e, and then it waits for the, the first thread to return f and then adds them. So that's the same, doing two computations in parallel. Except now we have explicit synchronization and uh, much more low-level ma memory management than when we just, just did f plus par, f par e, f plus e. But you can really see how, um, how the concurrency works. So very similar, you run these things the same way, use this, the SMP runtime, add two threads, it churns away, and it uses more CPU and it runs faster. So it's essentially the same technique, and the par things are, um, par sparks get turned into those Haskell threads created with 4KO. <coughs> so 4KO is really cool for hiding latency, because you can do an IO job, like, oh, I'll, I'll, I've got this network connection, I'll do some processing, and the web page back because you can create these things really cheaply. So you can create like one thread per connection. Um, I wrote an IRC bot that creates one thread per message in the IRC channel. And, and then I, I shipped this onto a 16 core machine and started running all the messages across the cores, which was really cool. Um, great for hiding latency if you have a slow, if you know, computations that take a long time, like writing to disk or pulling something from the network. Create more threads to do other things. Um, if the user's waiting for a result, fork a thread to do the work, give them back a prompt, and have the result returned asynchronously. Um, the runtime takes these threads and migrates them across how many cores you have, so you don't fix statically the number of cores. You can see how many cores the program has at runtime via a variable. Okay, so that was MBARs. Channels are another technique. Uh, these let you send messages in a queue to a receiver, and you can just keep pumping messages into the queue, and the receiver will take them out of the queue as they need them. Uh, it's a pipe-like structure. They're essentially a lazy structure in that it looks like a list of values that are arriving with delays between them. Um, so we can write simple programs like this. We create a channel. Main equals do creates a channel, which will be the pipe between two threads. We fork the worker thread, giving it a reference to the channel. The worker thread just sits in a loop, uh, reading the load average, v, and then writing it into the channel, so sending it back to the main thread. And then it sleeps for a little while. Uh, the main thread gets the channel contents, converts it into a lazy list of values that will just arrive whenever this guy sends a value. And then it maps, prints, so this is just a for loop, it just prints each thing as it comes out. So it's a really simple uh, concurrency uh, glue, this chance. Fork a thread, have it send results to me, I'll sit there doing whatever I like to do, which is print values from a channel. Okay, so that was the, the second main technique, explicit threads and shared memory. Similar to its regular old imperative programming, you've got MBARs are a really cool structure, though. Synchronizing based on the contents of a box is pretty easy to reason about. However, it's still subject to deadlock. Right? I can wait on a box that's never going to get filled, and then my, my program makes no progress. The way around that is via transactional memory, or one of the ways. So MBARs can deadlock if you wait on a value that never appears. Um, but we can write it in a lock-free style without these MBARs using transactional memory. It's high level in MBARs because it takes care of more details of the machine. Um, and it's also composable, so we can take programs that use STM and build them into larger and larger atomic chunks that are still guaranteed to be safe. Um, it's also slower than MBARs, obviously, because there's more work being done. The runtime's going to be watching um, the transaction for us. Again, multiple levels of resolution is kind of a theme here. There is not one parallelism or concurrency mechanism for every problem, just like there's not one 
memory management situation that solves every problem. We'll have transactions for some problems. We'll have explicit threads. Sometimes we use Spark. Sometimes we use data parallelism. So you should know about all this stuff, because this is how we're going to be programming in the future. We'll have cores. I'm going to have to program every different problem will need a different mechanism or a mixture of them. So in transactional memory, each atomic block, so a chunk of code inside an atomic statement, appears to work in complete isolation. That's the programming model. So the programming model is you are the only thread on the system, and only you can see the transaction variables. These, uh, they look like mbars. They're, they're mutable slots that you're going to put results in. So you write the code as if you're the only thread. You don't worry about contention or anything like that. You don't worry about waiting. The runtime then keeps an eye on what threads access your transaction variables. And if a thread beats you to them, it will just restart your transaction for you. So you, this is a really, uh, again, the safety property. If you don't have to worry about other threads on the system, that makes programming so much easier. Because you're not writing concurrent programming anymore. You're just writing straight line imperative code. Uh, and we'll see some examples. STM was added in 2005, so it's been there almost five years now. Uh, it's used in real systems. I've used it at work. Um, it's, I think it's probably the default concurrency synchronization mechanism you should reach for because it's safer than MVARs or explicit locks. Um, but then it's, it's also slower. It's like five to ten times slower than explicit locks. So depending on your situation, you may then want to drop down to a less safe level where you have to do more work. Um, it's an optimistic model. So you write this thing assuming you're not going to have any contention and you're always going to complete. And then you let the system check that you were indeed the only person that had access to those variables during the run. The system's going to retry it for you. And again, it requires control of side effects. Because if I'm running a transaction that accesses some shared memory, and I also write to disk, and then the runtime says I need to retry that computation, I've just rerun my side effect, and I've launched my missiles twice. So again, parallelism concurrency needs control of side effects. So ruling it out by default was a good idea. Um, in STM, in Haskell, it's tracked statically. Your code has to be in the STM um, box, the STM monad, which means you can't do I.O. You can only operate on shared memory, uh, which means the compiler can statically prove that your transactions are safe, um, whereas the couple of other languages that have STM rely on the programmer to do that and get it right. Uh, this is in the STM package. If you have Cabal, you can say Cabal unpack STM right now and poke around in it. Okay, how does it work? STM is the computational environment that lets you do pure code and transactional effects on memory. It has an atomically statement that takes a block of this transaction code and runs it as, an, as a piece of I.O. It has a retry statement that lets you rerun a transaction until, it basically blocks the transaction until one of the conditions changes, um, and or else lets us compose transactions into larger and larger units. We can build, we'll see some examples in a second. We can build up shared memory abstractions using STM. TVARs, for example. TVARs are the variables that the system will watch for contention. So you will write values into your TVARs and read them from them. Other threads will be doing the same thing. So if, if you have, say, a global game state, you might store it in a TVAR. And then each thread that's emulating uh, parts of the game will put values in, read values back, update user scores, and so on. And the system will just check that they all get ordered and have nice access to this memory. But each, each thread doesn't have to worry about the synchronization explicitly. If another thread beats it to you, you get rolled back. OK, so here's a bank account transfer in STM style. We have transfer takes two bank accounts, which we represent as transaction variables that store ints. And we take an amount, an argument that's an amount that will transfer from one to the other. And we run it in I.O. It has an effect on the world. We'll actually physically modify a bank account somewhere. Um, so it atomically says, treat this as a transaction. We'll try and run. We'll get a run at our code with all these variables. And then the runtime will check if anyone else beat us to either of the bank accounts and retry us afterwards. So we don't get interleaved halfway between a bank transfer with someone else trying to do it. Um, so we read the balance from, the, from account that we're going to take it from. Um, and then if the balance is less than the amount we need to transfer, we just block, essentially, the retry, which says suspend this thread, and the runtime will wake us up when something changes in one of the bank accounts. So maybe we'll then be able to actually do the transfer. Otherwise, we're good to go. So we write, we deduct the balance from the, the input account. We read the value of the account we're sending it to, and then we write the balance plus the amount we're transferring. And so we never write anything about 
are waiting explicitly here in this code. We just assume we get a straight run at these variables and no other thread is touching them. And there's actually many other threads on the system trying to write stuff into the bank account, but the runtime's just watching whoever touches this and that variable and make sure that each of them gets sequenced properly. So for it to be possible to roll back transactions, like I said, you can't have visible side effects. The type system enforces this. Um, so there's no way to do I.O. in a transaction. You can only have pure code. You can throw exceptions. You can have non-termination. That's kind of a side effect. Um, and you can touch this transactional memory, but that's all you can do. Anything else is a compile time error, which makes it safe. Um, retry is kind of the magic here. How does the runtime know when to wake up a thread? Well, it watches those transaction variables I've declared. If another thread touches the to or from, then it says, whoa, 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 you stop for a sec, let this guy finish, and then I'll let you run. Um, so it automatically sequences things so they can make progress. Um, or else is really cool, and this is unique to Haskell. It lets you combine chunks of atomic code into larger units that are still atomic. They still have the same properties. Um, sometimes, for example, we don't want to just retry if we can't transfer the balance from one account to another. We want to stop and generate an error or something like that. So or else lets us say, check this or check, do, do some other thing. Now, I was saying that you can't do I.O. in an STM block, but sometimes you actually can. You have to use unsafe I.O. to STM, which lets you lift I.O. code and run it inside a transaction. But then the burden is on you as the programmer to give a condition that says that I.O. action can safely be retried. So maybe it's like printing to the screen, and you don't care if you print to the screen multiple times. That's a safe kind of thing. But it's, the compiler can't prove that it's safe, so it's Sort of we use these unsafe functions in Haskell whenever you have to do some obligation to make sure the code's correct. Um, so unsafe in Haskell is usually regular in other languages. So when you see unsafe, it just means there's something the compiler can't prove for you, which is a pretty strong uh, definition of unsafe. Mostly, uh, for example, we can return a value from a transaction that we then run. So we might return a print statement from a transaction and then run it on the outside. So we don't need unsafe IO to STM. But it's useful, for example, if you want to wire up the transaction system in Haskell to a transaction system in another system, like a database, so that a, a retry in Haskell will retry in the database. So you can glue things together this way. So STM composes easily. It looks like imperative code. I mean, we step through sequentially how you would transfer money from a bank account. Um, but there's no deadlocks, and it's thread safe. There's still live lock, so you can keep fighting for access to a variable, so it doesn't rule out live lock, but it rules out deadlock. Um, so to make sure that you make progress, you make sure your transaction's short. Right? If you just end up putting your whole program inside a transaction, you're not going to get anywhere. You're just going to have one thread at a time, very, very slowly making progress. So that was the third technique. So we saw sparks, we saw explicit threads and mvars, and we saw transactional memory. The final one, and the newest one, and it's kind of a completely different model, is a form of deterministic parallelism called data parallelism. Um, we can write a lot of programs in those styles that I showed you. Most programs, all of them, in fact. Um, par and seek, however, they're light, but it's hard to get the granularity right. You have to guess that f and e are about the same cost. That's kind of hard to reason about in your head. 4KO and MVARS and STM are way more precise. You have precise control over scheduling, but they're more complex. We had to write more code. Um, so there's trade-offs here between abstraction and productivity and precision and control. Um, and there's a third point in here that Parallel Haskell lets us do is nested data problems. kind of combines two of these things to yield a different spot in the productivity and performance control space. So really simple idea. You have collections, and you do the same thing in parallel to every element. That's data parallelism. You have an array, you will do f in parallel to each element of the array. Um, if your program can be written in this style as mapping something in parallel over collection, then it's a really good programming model. You have no explicit threads. You just say map, and it runs in parallel. There's a clear cost model. You know that it's going to be the, the cost of f on each element of the array times divided by the number of cores you have. So it's pretty easy to work out statically the cost. It also has good locality for the kinds of hardware we have, so you can split up arrays into caches and um, partition them nicely. So to do this in Haskell, we have parallel array syntax. Looks like list syntax, but we have these little dots. I, I haven't yet worked out what the dots are supposed to signify. Like maybe it means there are, there are four cores 
So maybe that's kind of hinting at parallelism. I don't know. There's lots of little things. It's, I, if anyone has an idea of why that means a parallel array, I'd love to know. Um, and then you have all these combinators, these functions that transform data, like map and filter and zip and fold, except they all run in parallel across arrays. Um, and how they do it is different. So map applies, uses n threads to update each element of the array in parallel. Uh, filter skips across, zips combine arrays, and folds to a tree reduction. Um, and we also get to use parallel array comprehensions, which have parallel semantics. So that's a particular kind of syntax in a list comprehension that says run these two things in parallel. Data parallel Haskell is the uh, code name for this part of Haskell. And it's really oriented towards very large arrays and array algorithms, numerics. So simulations and FFTs and you know, weather simulation kind of stuff. So here's a data parallel program. It takes the sum of squares of an array of floats, computes the float. For each x in the array, square it, and then sum the resulting array. Or we can take the dot product, takes two arrays, produces a float. It zips them together by multiplying each element pairwise, and then sums the result down to a value. So very, very concise. And again, no locks, no threads. It's all inside sum and zip width, um, and using a parallel array. So the type here indicates that these arrays run in parallel. And that tells the compiler statically how to split up the data and so on. Um, so how does it do it? Breaks the arrays into chunks, n chunks across n cores, runs, generates loops for these things that apply the function arguments, times and sum and square, applies those in parallel across the elements, and then combines the results. So it's a pretty simple programming model. The downside, though, is that flat data parallelism is very, very restrictive. Right? You have to write all your programs as parallel transformations of data, of flat data. So it's not very compositional as well. If you have one, you make a library call that does some parallel stuff, you make another library call that does some parallel stuff, now you're trying to do twice as much work on the same amount of hardware, and you've just lost all performance. So, and also, we can't use rich data structures here. We don't have trees or anything like that. We just have flat arrays. So the next step that Haskell provides is nested data parallelism. have to, the type system prevents it. Yeah. yeah, it's in the type. And the, if the type says this is a float, it's not going to be an IO float. It can only be a pure expression. And again, yeah, you have to have, you can't have side effects in there. You can't go peeking around and modifying other bits of memory when you're supposed to be doing a parallel map. So the type, the type system, again, enforces all the kind of parallel constraints that we need to make this stuff work. Um, and you have to step outside and do some unsafe stuff if you want to break those, which maybe you do sometimes. Um, OK. So nested data parallelism, though, extends data parallelism to let us do an extra thing. We can do the same thing in parallel to each element of a collection. Plus, each thing that we do in turn can be a nested data parallel program. So it in turn can launch multiple threads. So if you can write a program this way, again, no explicit threads. But what it really needed was a compiler transformation that takes a, you know, a map of a map of a map that are all in parallel and turns it into a single flat map so that we get the right cost semantics. Um, so the GHC compiler implements this flattening. It's called the vectorize uh, flag that transforms systematically any nested set of parallel maps and folds into a flat array program. Um, and here's a nested program. We have a float and a vector, which is a array of floats, oh, an array of arrays of floats. And we can do matrix multiplication in, in one line here, where we just, for each row in the matrix, we then do vector multiplication on that. And then we yield a vector at the end. Here, the stuff in the middle of the list comprehension, the array comprehension, is in turn a parallel program. And the compiler takes these things, combines them, flattens them, and then runs the result. So it's pretty cool. So this required GHC to get really, really smart, though. It's a pretty aggressive optimization. It's transform, tra transforming the code entirely. Um, there's also a GPU backend, because GPUs are essentially data parallel hardware. So they do you know, update my pixel in parallel across all my pixels. Um, so the Accelerate library on Hackage provides this. And there's a nice talk on running, uh, running this code on a GPU um, from the Haskell Implementers Workshop last month. So a small example, here's, you can take this code if you have the stuff and run it now. It just takes the, it does the sum, sum of squares. We generate an array littered with numbers. We map um, over them. Uh, what are we trying to do? There's a missing argument there. And then we sum the result. That should be times n, I think. 
and then running that on my laptop there, it goes faster, which is pretty cool. Uses two cores, runs twice as fast. Okay, so data parallelism though, very new. Um, very, very, very few languages support data parallelism, especially nested data parallelism. And I don't think really any mainstream languages, certainly as mainstream as Haskell, there aren't any. Um, more programs, it, it's getting better. The transformation, the flattening transformation is getting better. But you can check out the latest status on that wiki page. So, winding up. There's this fast runtime with lots of threads. It has sparks, strategies, explicit threads, MVARs, STM, and data parallel arrays. This is all in GHC now, so you can take it and write your parallel programs now on your laptops. Um, the the one-click installer's there. Um, the work that came out of this, that was in this talk, comes from many, many research groups over 25 years. Uh, each different thing you saw was implemented by a different group and added to GHC. Here's, these guys have great papers that you can go and read that fill in the story in more detail. Um, I just wanted to quickly say, Gawa, why am I here from Gawa? Gawa uses Haskell for everything. We've been in business 10 years, we've built all our systems in Haskell. We, we build compilers, languages, we do build systems, operating system kernels, stuff like that, crypto. Um, we use Haskell, we use formal methods like Isabel. Um, we hired a Maud programmer recently, I know you guys use Maud here. So uh, if you're interested in a FP job, send your resume. Okay, thanks everyone. Go program those multi course. Questions? He said he was going to run. Um, I guess I'm wondering uh, how much of the multi-core goodness here that you're talking about is actually a function of the, the language, features of the language, and how much is other things. So like when I see the sparks plus the changes to the runtime, I think a lot like what Apple's done with blocked code and Grand Central Dispatch, and then you look at like data parallelism, things like that, you think a lot about CUDA. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering how much, like, is it really the language itself provide a great uh, me semantic mechanism through which you can express parallelism? And for example, there are other Haskell-based languages and things like that, that for like hardware, like Lava and BlueSpec, that are more geared towards really pinning down parallelism. I just wonder if you, what your thoughts on were on those sorts of things. I think uh, a lot of the parallel abstractions you saw are available in other languages. Um, but it's pretty rare to have all of them in one language. I think they're all in one language because it's easy to implement when you don't have to write additional analysis or additional support in the runtime to do the effect analysis that keeps coming up, for example. So it's, it, it means that we can just move a bit faster in getting all this stuff into GHC, whereas it just takes longer in you know, to get CUDA right requires they had to come up with this extra language separate to C. It looks like C, but it's restricted, and that's a lot of engineering work. And it's restricted in all sorts of weird ways, and it's just complicated. Whereas you can turn some of this stuff, you know, got added to GHC in weeks. Um, so the language is a good framework for moving really quickly. s is the perfect example here. s was in, in GHC way before anyone else got close. Just because it was, well, you know, we'll use the type system exactly like that, and we'll use the runtime just like that, and it's easy, we're done. So I think, the, I think the semantics make it easy to move fast, and it makes it easier to compose. Um, but you will see these things bleeding out into other languages over time. So I mean, obviously, uh, like Erlang, for example, built around concurrency as you, know, you have threads which communicate via messages. Um, and it's really designed for sort of distributed fault tolerance systems. Um, whereas the stuff I've concentrated on today has been more about performance on multi-core, which involves like packing data together closely and running lots of hardware threads. So the, you have to be really careful to distinguish the concurrency stuff that Erlang does from sort of the performance-oriented parallelism that Haskell does. They're really trying to touch on different spaces there. Yeah. But in both cases, the language enables you know, the developers to move faster to try out new ideas in parallelism and concurrency. So you, you, you get deterministic results because uh, the approach in Haskell is very dramatic and says no side effects, period. But when you want to run something in parallel, 
you want to be probably more, a little bit more linear, say ILO side effects, what it's important is that I don't have conflicting side effects, I don't have conflicting updates, I don't have conflicting rights. I want to allow side effects as long as they are not conflicting, they are not writing into the same locations in memory. Yeah. So what, what, what is your thought on that? I think that's true. Often, you know, it's safe to, like, in Data Parallel Haskell, the layer underneath uses the ST monad, which lets you do mutable updates on arrays. And then it just freezes it and presents a pure interface. So you can still have side effects. They're just not on by default. You have to enable them as the programmer. So we don't just allow anyone to write anything and hope that some percent of those programs are safe. We just make all programs that, by default, you can write will be safe to parallelize. And then if the programmer knows something extra that the compiler doesn't know about why a piece of arbitrary code is safe, they can enable it with these unsafe operations. Um, but the burden is on them to justify it. It just makes you think about why you're adding, you know, writing to disk in the middle of a transaction. So it's certainly possible. It's not that you rule it out entirely. It's just you don't make it the default. We make parallelism the default, and then you add imperative stuff later. You don't make imperative coding the default and try and discover parallelism after the fact. Yeah. So you made a good point about Erlang. Um, kind of two kinds of ways. So one about concurrency. You have programs that are going to touch the real world. Uh, maybe it has an interface uh, or is controlling motors. And Erlang is a language really built to, to deal with concurrency by that definition pretty well. So you said, yeah, at Haskell we're focusing on performance. On the other hand, um, okay, great, I have a functional program, but interesting functional programs deal with very large data sets. And so far, what I'm seeing in Haskell, you don't really think about uh, the fact that data has mass. So I'll contrast that with a database engine where something like SQL Server, they'll think pretty hard in the query optimizer about what they're doing about runtime with, well, how much memory are we allocating? Are we getting memory pressure on the overall system? Will we give memory back to the operating system itself? You talked a little bit about recognizing that you do get memory pressure. You know, when I'm doing speculative parallelism, I'm going to allocate more. Maybe I'll tweak out the garbage collector a little bit. Yeah. But in the runtime as a whole, have you guys started thinking about that data has mass and how would Haskell scale up to extremely large data sets? So, for example, different, well, different programming models have better cost models. I think that's essentially what's going on here. Sparks has a very difficult to reason about cost model because you're just generating lots of these things and you don't know how many. Data parallelism, for example, has a very good cost model. So you can load your, your terabyte arrays into your memory if you've got enough, and then operate on them in parallel. And you know precisely and statically uh, how you're going to partition this stuff. So you have a really good sense of how to deal with the data. So different programming models for different uh, costs, I think. Um, but not, everyone, not, not every model gives you the same sense of mass as you talk about. Um, so that's what I was sort of getting about with the, uh, the clear cost model here, is that it's much easier to reason about how much is in memory when I'm using a data parallel program than when I'm doing a Sparks program. Um, if I'm using fork IO, it's kind of up to me. I'm, I'm back in, I'm pr pretty much just Erlang. I'm writing a thread and I'm sending messages around. So if I load memory, I, I know right there that I did it. It's, it didn't happen for me by the, by the runtime. Um, so, but I think it really depends on the programming model, is, is my summary. So this talk has been about parallelism within a single um, language environment. And oftentimes you have multiple machines and there's um, different services running on different machines, but you might have, say, one machine is creating the tasks which the other one has to execute and you send the messages to it. And sometimes if you don't program it correctly, you get sequential um, communication where it says, okay, do this task, then do this next task, and so on. Is there any work to provide that at a language level, language level support so that the programmer doesn't have to say, oh, now I have multiple machines, now I have to figure out how to do all of my scheduling and so on.
Is there sort of a, an upper limit on some of these techniques, like uh, mass message passing, where eventually if you get too many cores, the cost of all of the message passing going on from one to another is just so high that you don't see any more gains? Great talk, by the way. I, I really did appreciate it. Um, when I sort of think about uh, Haskell and functional programming languages, I sort of have that traditional, um, like, uh, hmm, performance concerns, the worries about that. So I was wondering, um, just from your experience, since I, I don't really know much of anything about Haskell, does it, um, does it uh, scale better to sort of like uh, programs or... Um, code involving lots of uh, small tasks, lots of small uh, sparks and so forth? Or do you think it would scale uh, better to much larger programs, say something like you know, an entire uh, macro kernel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, does the vectorizer support type classes? I think there were patches for that recently. So go and talk to Roman, Roman Lashinsky. He's the, he's the vectorizer god. He sort of sits there, he's, he's this Russian guy, he sits there grumbling about how the GHC optimizer treats him badly and then he pushes these massive patches that just change you know, how we do Haskell programming. But uh, yeah, he's the guy to talk to. Okay, cool. Thanks everyone. <laughs>